A shocking crime rocks a peaceful suburban neighborhood. Fear definitely gripped the subdivision. But there are few leads. There was really pretty much of a lack of physical evidence in this case. In my viewpoint, everyone was a person of interest except me. And with nowhere left to turn, detectives reach out to an unusual source. I see four people. There are two and two. I feel just total chaos here. Total chaos. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. Nine one one, what's the location of your emergency? Did you hear anything? Okay, is he in the house? County units respond to Shorewood Forest. I received a call of a possible murder in Shorewood Forest. 18's clear, I'll be in room. As I was coming into the subdivision, there were three residents standing there identified themselves as neighbors and friends of Mr. Ferrez. Okay, you stay here, I'll go check everything out. Okay. The patio door was open. The house had been ransacked pretty good from where I was at. When I walked in the garage service store, um, I saw the victim, Mr. Ferrez, lying face up on the ground in a pool of coagulated blood. There was a, about a four-foot piece of firewood lying above his head, and then lying down by his feet, there was a wood axe. His eyes are open, and he's looking. It's not like TV at all. Um, it was um, something that I've carried with me since. The officer seals off the residence and calls for backup. Because there's not that many homicides which occur during the course of a year, when one does occur, then the Porter County Sheriff's Department and its detectives work round the clock. But the search for clues presents a challenge. The residence has been turned upside down. It was probably one of the worst I've seen as far as a home being ransacked. The icebox door was standing open, the freezer door was standing open. The grandfather clock. Okay, grandfather was open and as if someone was going through the inner workings. We'd experienced for the couple months leading into the Ferrier murder a string of burglaries. As a police officer, we suspected that they may be tied in together. Was this crime committed by the same burglary ring? They were obviously looking for something. Um, whether they found it or not, I don't know. Despite all the chaos, the killer seems to have done a good job of covering his tracks. Investigators struggle to find even a shred of physical evidence tying a perpetrator to the crime. The murder weapon is a very important item, and for this piece of wood, it was tested to match it with Mr. Ferry's blood, and uh, was certified through the forensic lab that it, it bore his blood and hair and uh, skin. But just identifying the murder weapon doesn't necessarily lead to the killer. Fingerprints were out of the question because of the texture of the wood. We were able to certify it as the murder weapon, but that was about all. You look for, as a prosecutor, evidence that can tie you to a definite defendant, and I think there was really pretty much of a lack of physical evidence in this case. While the evidence technicians from the Indiana State Police was processing the home, uh, myself and other detectives, of course, began interviewing neighbors. According to neighbors, Lloyd Foray was a guy who seemed to have it all. The young bachelor had just taken over the family's lucrative warehousing business. His net worth was in the millions, and he was a very successful young businessman, popular with the community and his employees. With such a well-known victim, the pool of possible suspects to wade through is huge. And pretty soon we were working round the clock, trying to connect people and locate people that he would be familiar with. As you start to try to clear people out as suspects and develop suspects and leads. In my viewpoint, everyone was a person of interest except me. And then investigators finally get their first solid lead neighbor reported they had heard 
uh, the noise that sounded like squealing tires. A different neighbor saw a, uh, what he described as a pickup truck. No tire tracks are found around Foray's home, but in his haste to flee the scene, the driver has left other evidence. The vehicle slipped, hit the fence. Okay, kind of knocked the fence over a little bit. On the fence was green paint, which gave us kind of a color of the vehicle. It's a solid clue, but still doesn't lead police to a suspect. And without any new leads, the investigation slows to a crawl. With each passing day, the community grows increasingly tense. These exclusive houses, which had a lot of valuable property in them, were pretty easy pickings for burglars in that area. Fear definitely gripped the subdivision. I mean, people were very much um, uneasy in their homes. Patrols were increased dramatically. Desperate to solve the case, Detective Weeks looks for answers from a stranger hundreds of miles away. I became aware of Mr. Phil Jordan through a colleague in a different police agency, a local police agency here. The use of psychics and in police investigation is pretty much non-traditional. However, at the same time, uh, I, I'm not the kind of person that would rule out that someone might have that kind of ability. All Detective Weeks tells Phil is that he's investigating a murder, but already the psychic is sensing the crime. Often when I first uh, talk about a case, impressions will start coming to me. Yeah? Well, I feel there's a victim with severe trauma to the head. Someone I feel, I feel a chunk of firewood. And I also keep seeing a green pickup truck. There were things that he said, perceived, that I felt was extremely interesting. But police are no closer to a suspect. Hoping for a break, the detective flies psychic Phil Jordan to Indiana to walk through the crime scene. When I come into a case, I don't like to know a lot of the facts about the case. I'd rather tell you what has happened. Now, Shorewood is a very affluent kind of area. Uh, a place you would not expect to, for crime to be occurring. Very quiet neighborhood, quiet subdivision, very well. I, I see, see four, four people, people. Very, <laughs> nervous, very nervous, very nervous. Two and two for some reason. Two and two. There was two lookouts, and I think one of them might have been posted right here. What he perceived was two people waited in the car as a lookout. Two outside that were lookouts, and two inside, two inside. I think they went up and around here. Oh, I feel just total chaos here. Total chaos. Go. Going through drawers. They see yeah. things of value, things that they knew they could fence off real easily, real easily. I feel they just ransacked the entire place looking for anything of value. Was there something in particular you think they were looking for? Um, old, something old. Something of value. Maybe antiques or antique coins, photography type equipment, cameras, things like that. Again, the psychic's right on track. We didn't know that Mr. Foray owned camera equipment. Working at the scene with the aid of uh, relatives of Mr. Foray, we were able to determine uh, m among the items missing, there was photography equipment and coin collections. Mr. Foray returned home earlier than anticipated. As I walk in the house and see that it's been ransacked, I can hear a noise in another room. My heart begins to beat. I have really got to get help. 
They've got to confront this while they're here. And they know there's something in the garage I can get as a weapon. Is the garage out this way? Yes. I think he came to the garage to to try to find a weapon, something he could defend himself with. There was an axe found at his feet, uh, which we tend to think he, that he apparently grabbed. I feel that he heard a noise. Heard a noise. Oh, hey, wait, wait, no, you man. Take it easy. He tells me to remain calm, remain calm. Something out of the corner of my eye. <gasps> the neck and then I remember nothing. Phil's vision aligns perfectly with the evidence. We're sure that when the intruders saw Mr. Ferry, they, they knew they had their hands full and that's why they struck him twice and the second fatal blow was after he was already down. I could feel the hit to the head and the hit to the back of the head. As, As I, I feel, feel my, my life, life going, going away, away from, from me, I wonder why. I wonder why did this happen to me. Phil is right on target, but before the burglary ring strikes again, can Phil put police on the killer's trail when we return? Psychic Phil Jordan has witnessed the Lloyd Foray murder with haunting clarity. I see four people. There's two and two for some reason. There's something in the garage. Green pickup truck. A burglary that went wrong. Horribly wrong. Investigators believe a burglary ring has been operating in the Shorewood subdivision for months. During November and December, before uh, Mr. Foray's home burglary and death, there was a number of burglaries that was occurring in the Shorewood subdivision. And we were very much interested, obviously, who was involved in those burglaries. We had uh, been working our informants for information. Everyone would deny knowing each other. The, the part of the task of this job was showing their association and how they associated with one another. And now that the ring may have graduated to murder, the clock is really ticking. I knew that the individuals involved in the crime had committed these crimes before, so they had to have a criminal history, so I knew it was probable there would be mugshots of them. Detective Weeks called me back to the sheriff's office for a second meeting. We have many photographs here to look at uh, that have been mentioned during the course of our investigation. And in that meeting, he had a group of mugshots of individuals that he felt fit the M.O. or may have fit the descriptions that I was giving. Bill, I have to take a look at some of your photographs here. What, what do you perceive? Tall, slender man with dark hair, dark eyes, facial hair, scruffy facial hair. Younger men, probably in their 20s. This one's interesting to me. I also, this one here. I think he was definitely there. For some reason I feel both of these individuals involved in the crime itself. I was able to pick out four mugshots out of this group of individuals. And he indicated on those photographs two individuals who he thought was directly involved in the burglary itself and potentially involved in the uh, death of Mr. Foray. Two other photographs he looked at and felt they were accomplices and served as a lookout. 
I told Detective Weeks that one of the individuals could be pressured into bringing forth information that would implicate the others and that he would subsequently be arrested in an auto theft. And I was impressed with some of the things that he perceived. There were things that I thought were of interest, uh, extreme interest. Then the psychic tunes in to something more. I also think there will be a person named Larry who will somehow be involved, not directly, I don't think he was at the scene of the crime, but I feel indirectly like somebody they may have gone to after the incident or somebody that may have been indirectly connected, like somebody they may have fenced off stolen goods to. He recognized the first name of Larry as having some significance and would be of importance in the investigation. We suspected that some of the missing property went to a pawn shop where there was an employee by the name of Larry. Detectives follow Phil's lead and question the pawn shop owner named Larry, hoping to find a link to the four suspects. One of the people that might be involved uh, claims that he has sold various items. But when Larry denies knowing the men from the mugshots, detectives are again at a dead end. Then, a shocking twist. Phil's prediction about the informant comes true. 19-year-old Terry Keeler is arrested for auto theft. Detective Weeks recognizes the face. He's one of the men Phil identified from the mug shots. The Maryville Police Department had arrested an individual for possession of a stolen car. And he was looking for a negotiation. He was looking to get out from jail. And so he alleged he had information about the foray, homicide, and burglary that he wanted to give if he could get something in return. Hoping to crack the suspect, Detective Weeks challenges Keeler's story. And when I said that I didn't believe a word that he was saying, is when he came back with, with well, how about a green truck and a fence just jumped out in front of it and got it dented on the side? Does that mean anything to you? Have Phil's incredible leads helped police find the murderer? After weeks of frustration in the unsolved murder of Lloyd Foray, psychic Phil Jordan's clues have led police to one of the suspects. A blow to the side of the head that takes me right down to the ground. I see four people. Two and two for some reason. Terry Keeler is being charged with possession of a stolen property, stolen vehicle. He was looking to get a cut on this deal. He was looking for a plea negotiations or maybe even get out from underneath the charge. Keeler confesses that he and an associate were paid to act as lookouts for the two other men robbing Foray's home. Two burglars, two lookouts, just as Phil envisioned. Prosecutors give Keeler immunity in exchange for his testimony. According to his own statement, he was only marginally involved in the crime. Unless you offer a deal to someone like Terry Keeler, then you have no way to prosecute the case. I don't think any law enforcement officer likes to give someone a free pass. But the reality of it is, is sometimes there's just really no linking evidence. What the state's witness told us was that he was approached by a man named Jim. Jim offered him $100 to be as a lookout, to drive a, a car and be a lookout for them. He said he accepted that offer. Jim, AKA Bennett James Hobbs, is familiar to police. He's one of the other faces from the mugshots Phil Jordan identified. He was quite polite. Uh, and seemed uh, very concerned that he would be connected in any way to this homicide. He seemed like a, a fairly believable person, but his alibi turned out to be false. According to Keeler, Hobbs admitted to killing Foray after the homeowner came at him with an axe, exactly as Phil had seen it. Hobbs is tried and convicted of murder and sentenced to 50 years. The police always 
hope to get all individuals involved in these cases brought to justice and sometimes that is just not possible and in this particular case uh, there were a few individuals who escaped punishment thanks to the insights of psychic Phil Jordan a murderer is behind bars four people something of value would pick up truck or burglary had gone around there were things that he said we could link to the investigation. We didn't know that Mr. Ferre owned camera equipment. We didn't know that the first name of Larry may have some significance. We didn't know that it was a green pickup truck. If it can help me get details that will assist my investigation and lead me to the ultimate suspect, it's worth a try. Would I contact Phil again? Absolutely.